I now come to that part of my life during which I planned and finally succeeded in making my escape from slavery. But before narrating any of the particular circumstances, I deem it proper to make known my intention not to state all the facts connected with the transaction. My reason for pursuing this course may be understood from the following. First, were I to give a minute statement of all the facts, it is not only possible but quite probable that others would thereby be involved in the most embarrassing difficulties. Secondly, such a statement would most undoubtedly induce greater vigilance on the part of slaveholders than has existed heretofore among them, which would of course be the means of guarding a door whereby some dear brother bondman might escape his galling chains. I deeply regret the necessity that impels me to suppress anything of importance connected with my experience in slavery. It would afford me great pleasure indeed, as well as the materially add to the interest of my narrative, were I at liberty to gratify a curiosity, which I know exists in the minds of many, by an accurate statement of all the facts pertaining to my most fortunate escape. But I must deprive myself of this pleasure, and the curious the gratification which such a statement would afford. I would allow myself to suffer under the greatest imputations which evil-minded men might suggest, rather than exculpate myself and thereby run the hazard of closing the slightest avenue by which a brother slave might clear himself of the chains and fetters of slavery. I have never approved of the very public manner in which some of our Western friends have conducted what they call the Underground Railroad, which I think, by their open declarations, has made most emphatically the Upper Ground Railroad. I honor those good men and women for their noble daring and applaud them for willingly subjecting themselves to bloody persecution by openly avowing their participation in the escape of slaves. I, however, can see very little good resulting from such a course, either to themselves or to the slaves escaping, while upon the other hand, I see and feel assured that those open declarations are a positive evil to the slaves remaining who are seeking to escape. They do nothing towards enlightening the slave, whilst they do much towards enlightening the master. They stimulate him to greater watchfulness and enhance his power to capture his slave. We owe something to the slaves south of the line as well as to those north of it. And in aiding the latter on their way to freedom, we should be careful to do nothing which would be likely to hinder the former from escaping from slavery. I would keep the merciless slaveholder profoundly ignorant of the means of flight adopted by the slave. I will leave him to imagine himself surrounded by myriads of invisible tormentors, ever ready to snatch from his infernal grip his trembling prey. Let him be left to fill his way in the dark. Let darkness commensurate with his crime hover over him, and let him feel that at every step he takes, in pursuit of the flying bondman, he is running the frightful risk of having his hot brains dashed out by an invisible agency. Let us render the tyrant no aid. Let us not hold the light by which he can trace the footprints of our flying brother. But enough of this. I will now proceed to the statement of foe's facts connected with my escape, for which I am alone responsible, and for which no one can be made to suffer but myself. In the early part of the year 1838, I became quite restless. I could see no reason why I should, at the end of each week, pour the reward of my toll into the purse of my master. When I carried to him my weekly wages, he would, after counting the money, look in my face with a robber-like fierceness and ask, is this all? He was satisfied with nothing less than the last cent. He would, however, when I made him six dollars, sometimes give me six cents to encourage me. It had the exact opposite effect. I regarded it as a sort of admission of my right to the whole. The fact that he gave me any part of my wages was proof, to my mind, that he believed me entitled to the whole of them. I always felt worse for having received anything, for I feared that giving me a few cents would ease his conscience and make him feel himself to be a pretty honorable robber. My discontent grew upon me. I was ever on the lookout for means of my escape, and finding no direct means, I determined to try to hire my time with a view of getting enough money to wish to make my escape. In the spring of 1838, when Master Thomas came to Baltimore to purchase his spring goods, I got an opportunity and applied to him to allow me to hire my time. He unhesitatingly refused my request and told me this was another stratagem by which to escape. He told me I could go nowhere, but that he could get me, and that in the, event of my, in the event of my running away, he should spare no pains in his efforts to catch me. He exhorted me to content myself and be obedient. He told me if I would be happy, I must lay out no plans for the future. He said if I behaved myself properly, he would take care of me. 
Indeed, he advised me to complete thoughtlessness of the future and taught me to depend solely on him for happiness. He seemed to fully see the pressing necessity of setting aside my intellectual nature in order to contentment for slavery. But in spite of him, and even in spite of myself, I continued to think, and to think about the injustice of my enslavement and the means of my escape. About two months after this, I applied to Master Hugh for the privilege of hiring my time. He was not acquainted with the fact that I had applied to Master Thomas and had been refused. He too at first seemed disposed to refuse, but after some reflection, he granted me the privilege and proposed the following terms. I was to be allowed all my time, make all contracts with those with whom I worked, and find my own employment. In return for this liberty, I was to pay him at the end of each week $3. Find myself in caulking tools and in board and clothing. My board was $2 and a half per week. This, with the wear and tear of clothing and caulking tools, made my regular expenses about $6 per week. This amount I was compelled to make up or relinquish the privilege of hiring my time. Rain or shine, work or no work, at the end of each week, the money must be forthcoming or I must give up my privilege. This arrangement, it will be perceived, was decidedly in my master's favor. It relieved him of all the need of looking after me. His money was sure. He received all the benefits of slaveholding without its evils, while I endured all the evils of a slave and suffered all the care and anxiety of a free man. I found it a hard bargain, but hard as it was, I thought it better than the old mode of getting along. It was a step towards freedom to be allowed to bear the responsibility of a free man, and I was determined to hold on upon it. I bent myself to the work of making money. I was ready to work at night as well as day, and by the most untiring perseverance and industry, I made enough to meet my expenses and lay up a little money every week. I went on thus from May until August. Master Hugh then refused to allow me to hire my time any longer. The ground for his refusal was a failure on my part one Saturday night to pay him for my week's time. This failure was occasioned by my attending a camp meeting about 10 miles from Baltimore. During the week, I had entered into an engagement with a number of young friends to start from Baltimore to a campground early Saturday evening. And being detained by my employer, I was unable to get down to Master Hughes without disappointing the company. I knew that Master Hughes was in no special need of the money that night. I therefore decided to go to the camp meeting and upon my return, pay him the $3. I stayed at the camp meeting one day longer than I intended when I left. But as soon as I returned, I called upon him to pay him what he considered his due. I found him very angry. He could scarce restrain his wrath. He said that he had a great mind to give me a severe whipping. He wished to know how I dared go out of the city without asking his permission. I told him I hired my time, and while I paid him the price which he asked for, I did not know that I was bound to ask him when and where I should go. This reply troubled him, and after reflecting a few moments, he turned to me and said I should hire my time no longer, that the next thing he would know of, I would be running away. Upon the same plea, he told me to bring my tools and clothing home forthwith. I did so, but instead of seeking work, as I had been accustomed to do previously to hiring my time, I spent the whole week without the performance of a single stroke of work. I did this in retaliation. Saturday night, he called upon me as usual for my week's wages. I told him I had no wages. I had done no work that week. Here we were upon the point of coming to blows. He raved and swore his determination to get hold of me. I did not allow myself a single word, but was resolved. If he had laid the weight of his hands upon me, it should be blow for blow. He did not strike me. He told me that he would find me in a constant employment in the future. I thought the matter over during the next day, Sunday and finally resolved upon the third day of September as the day upon which I would make my second attempt to secure my freedom. I now had three weeks during which to prepare for my journey. Early on Monday morning, before Master Hugh had time to make any arrangement for me, I went out and got employment of Mr. Butler at his shipyard near the drawbridge upon what is called the city block, thus making it unnecessary for him to seek any employment for me. At the end of the week, I boarded between eight and nine dollars. He seemed very well pleased and asked why I did not do the same the week before. He little knew what my plans were. My object in working steadily was to remove any suspicion he might entertain of my intent to run away, and in this I succeeded admirably. I suppose that he thought I was never better satisfied with my condition than at the very time during which I was planning my escape. The second week passed, and again I carried him my full wages, 
and so well pleased was he that he gave me 25 cents, quite a large slum for a slaveholder to give a slave, and bade me to make good use of it. I told him I would. Things went on very smoothly indeed, but within there was trouble. It was impossible for me to describe my feelings as the time of my contemplated start drew near. I had a number of warm-hearted friends in Baltimore, friends that I love almost as I did my life, and the thought of being separated from them forever was painful beyond expression. It is my opinion that thousands who would escape from slavery who now remain, but for the strong cords of affection that bind them to their friends. The thought of leaving my friends was decidedly the most painful thought with which I had to contend. The love of them was my tender point and shook my decision more than all things. Besides the pain of separation, the dread and apprehension of a failure exceeded what I experienced at my first attempt. The appalling defeat I then sustained returned to tor torment me. I felt assured that if I failed in this attempt, my case would be a hopeless one. It was still my fate as a slave forever. I could not hope to get off with anything less than the severest punishment and being placed beyond the means of escape. It required no vivid imagination to depict the most frightful scenes through which I should have to pass in case I failed. The wretchedness of slavery and the blessedness of freedom were perpetually before me. It was life and death with me, but I remained firm, and according to my resolution, on the third day of September, 1838, I left my chains and succeeded in reaching New York without the slightest interruption of any kind. How I did so, what means I adopted, what direction I traveled, and by what mode of conveyance I must leave unexplained, for the reasons before mentioned. I have been frequently asked how I felt when I found myself in a free state. I have never been able to answer that question with any satisfaction to myself. It was a moment of the highest excitement I ever experienced. I suppose I felt as one may imagine an unarmed mariner to feel when he is rescued by a friendly man of war from the pursuit of a pirate. In writing to a friend immediately after my arrival at New York, I said I felt like one who had escaped a den of hungry lions. The state of mind, however, was very soon subsided, and I again was seized with a feeling of great insecurity and loneliness. I was yet liable to be taken back and subject to all the tortures of slavery. This in itself was enough to damp the ardor of my enthusiasm but the loneliness overcame me. There I was in the midst of thousands, and yet a perfect stranger, without home and without friends, in the midst of thousands of my own brethren, children of a common father, and yet I dared not to unfold to any one of them my sad condition. I was afraid to speak to anyone, for fear of speaking to the wrong one, and thereby falling into the hands of money-loving kidnappers, whose business it was to lie in wait for the panting fugitive, as the ferocious beasts of the forest lie in wait for their prey. The motto which I adopted when I started from slavery was this, trust no man. I saw in every white man an enemy and in almost every colored man cause for distrust. It was a most painful situation and to understand it, one must needs experience it or imagine himself in similar circumstances. Let him be a fugitive slave in a strange land, a land given up to be to the hunting ground for slaveholders whose inhabitants are legalized kidnappers where he is every moment subjected to the terrible liability of being seized upon by his fellow man, as the hideous crocodile seizes upon his prey. I say, let him place himself in my situation without home or friends, without money or credit, wanting shelter and no one to give it, wanting bread and no money to buy it, and at the same time let him feel that he is pursued by merciless men hunters in total darkness as to what to do, where to go, or where to stay. Perfectly helpless, both as to the means of defense and the means of escape. In the midst of plenty, yet suffering the terrible gnawings of hunger. In the midst of houses, yet having no home. Among fellow men, yet feeling as if in the midst of wild beasts, whose greediness to swallow up the trembling and half-famished fugitives is only equal by that with which the monsters of the deep swallow up the helpless fish upon which they subsist. I say, let him be placed in the midst of these trying situations, this trying situation, the situation in which I was placed, then and not only then will he fully appreciate the hardships of and know how to sympathize with the toil-worn and whip-scarred fugitive slave. Thank heaven I remained but a short time in this distressed situation. I was relieved from it by the humane hand of Mr. David Ruggles, whose vigilance, kindness, and perseverance I shall never forget. I am glad of an opportunity to express, as far as words can, the love and gratitude I bear him. Mr. Ruggles is now afflicted with blindness, 
and is himself in need of the same kind of offices which he was once so forward in the performance of toward others. I had been in New York but a few days when Mr. Ruggles sought me out and very kindly took me in to his boarding house at the corner of Church and Les Bernard Streets. Mr. Ruggles was then very deeply engaged in the memorable Dark case, as well as attending to a number of other fugitive slaves, devising ways and means of their successful escape. And though watched and hemmed in on every side, he seemed to be more than a match for his enemies. Very soon after I went to Mr. Ruggles, he wished to know of me where I wanted to go, as he deemed it unsafe for me to remain in New York. I told him I was a caulker and should like to go where I could get work. I thought of going to Canada, but he decided against it, and in favor of my going to New Bedford, thinking I should be able to get work there at my trade. At this time, Anna, my intended wife, came on, for I wrote to her immediately upon my arrival in New York, notwithstanding my homelessness, houselessness, and helpless condition, informing her of my successful flight and wishing her to come forthwith. In a few days after her arrival, Mr. Ruggles called on the Reverend James W.C. Pennington, who in the presence of Mr. Ruggles, Mrs. Michaels, and two or three others, performed the marriage ceremony and gave us a certificate of which the following is an exact copy. This is it may certify that I joined together in holy matrimony, Frederick Johnson and Anna Murray as man and wife in the presence of Mr. David Ruggles and Mrs. Michaels, James W.C. Pennington, New York, September 15, 1838. Upon receiving the certificate and a $5 bill for Mr. Ruggles, I shouldered one part of our baggage and Anna took up the other, and we set out forthwith to take passage on board the steamboat John W. Richmond for Newport, on our way to New Bedford. Mr. Ruggles gave me a letter to a Mr. Shaw in Newport and told me in case my money did not serve me to New Bedford to stop in Newport and obtain further assistance. But upon our arrival at Newport, we were so anxious to get to a place of safety that notwithstanding we lacked the necessary money to pay our fare, we decided to take seats in the stage and promised to pay when we got to New Bedford. We were encouraged to do this by two excellent gentlemen, residents of New Bedford, whose names I afterward ascertained to be Joseph Rickinson and William C. Tabor. They seemed at once to understand our circumstances and gave us such assurance of their friendliness as to put us fully at ease in their presence. It was good indeed to, be, to meet such friends at such a time. Upon reaching New Bedford, we were directed to the house of Mr. Nathan Johnson, by whom we were kindly received and hospitably provided for. Both Mr. and Mrs. Johnson took a deep and lively interest in our welfare. They proved themselves quite worthy of the name abolitionists. When the stave driver found us unable to pay our bill, he held upon our luggage as security for the debt. I had but to mention the fact to Mr. Johnson, and he forthwith advanced the money. We now begin to feel a degree of safety and to prepare ourselves for the duties and responsibilities of a life of freedom. On the morning after our arrival in New Bedford, while at the breakfast table, the question arose as to what name I should be called by. The name given me by my mother was Frederick Augustus Washington Bailey. I, however, had dispensed with the two middle names long before I left Maryland so that I was generally known by the name of Frederick Bailey. I started from Baltimore bearing the name of Stanley. When I got to New York, I again changed my name to Frederick Johnson and thought that would be the last change. But when I got to New Bedford, I found it necessary again to change my name. The reason of this necessity was that there were so many Johnsons in New Bedford, it was already difficult to distinguish between them. I gave Mr. Johnson the privilege of choosing me a name, but told him he must not take from me the name of Frederick. I must hold on to that to preserve a sense of my identity. Mr. Johnson had been reading The Lady of the Lake and at once suggested that my name be Douglas. From that time until now, I have been called Frederick Douglas, and as I am more widely known by that name than by either of the others, I shall continue to use it as my own. I was quite disappointed at the general appearance of things in New Bedford. The impression which I had received respecting the character and condition of the people of the North, I find to be singularly erroneous. I had very strangely supposed, while in slavery, the few of the comforts and scarcely any of the luxuries of life were enjoyed at the North, compared with what was enjoyed by the slaveholders of the South. I probably came to this conclusion from the fact that Northern people own no slaves. I suppose that they were upon a level with the non-slaveholding population of the South. I knew they were exceedingly poor, and I had been accustomed to regard their poverty as a necessary consequence of their being non-slaveholders. 
I had somehow imbibed the opinion that in the absence of slaves there could be no wealth and very little refinement. And upon coming to the North, I expected to meet with a rough, hard-handed, and uncultivated population living in the most Spartan-like simplicity, knowing nothing of the ease, luxury, and pomp, and grandeur of the Southern slaveholders. Such being my conjectures, anyone acquainted with the appearance of New Bedford may very readily infer how palpably I must have seen my mistake. In the afternoon of the day when I reached New Bedford, I visited the wharves to take a view of the shipping. I found myself surrounded with the strongest proofs of wealth. Lying at the wharves and riding in the streams, I saw many ships of the finest model, in the best order, and of the largest size. Upon the right and the left, I was walled in by granite warehouses of the wildest dimensions, stowed to their utmost capacity with the necessities and comforts of life. Added to this, almost everybody seemed to be at work, but noiselessly so, compared with what I had been accustomed to in Baltimore. There were no loud songs heard from those engaged in loading and unloading ships. I heard no deep oaths or horrid curses on the laborer. I saw no whipping of men, but all seemed to go on smoothly. Every man appeared to understand his work and went at it with a sober yet cheerful earnestness, which betokened the deep interest which he felt in what he was doing, as well as a sense of his own dignity as a man. To me, this looked exceedingly strange. From the wharfs, I strolled around and over the town, gazing with wonder and admiration at the splendid churches, beautiful dwellings, and finely cultivated gardens, evincing an amount of wealth, comfort, taste, and refinement, such as I had never seen in any part of slaveholding Maryland. Everything looked clean, new, and beautiful. I saw few or no dilapidated houses with poverty-stricken inmates, no half-naked children and barefooted women, such as I had seen and been accustomed to seeing in Hillsborough, Eastern, St. Michael's, and in Baltimore. The people looked more able, stronger, healthier, and happier than those of Maryland. I was for once made glad by a view of extreme wealth without being saddened by seeing extreme poverty. But the most astonishing as well as the most interesting thing to me was the condition of colored people, a great many of whom, like myself, had escaped thither as a refuge from the hunters of men. I found many who had not been seven years out of their chains, living in finer houses and evidently enjoying more of the comforts of life than the average slaveholders of Maryland. I will venture to assert that my friend, Mr. Nathan Johnson, of whom I can say with a grateful heart, I was hungry and he gave me meat. I was thirsty and he gave me drink. I was a stranger and he took me in. Lived in a neater house, dined at a better table, took, paid for, and read more newspapers, better understood the moral, religious, and political character of the nation than nine-tenths of the slaveholders in Talbot County, Maryland. Yet Mr. Johnson was a working man. His hands were hardened by toil, and not his alone, but those also of Mrs. Johnson. I found the colored people more spirited than I had supposed they would be. I found among them a determination to protect each other from the bloodthirsty kidnapper at all hazards. Soon after my arrival, I was told of a circumstance which illustrated their spirit. A colored man and a fugitive slave were on unfriendly terms. The former was heard to threaten the latter with informing his master of his whereabouts. Straight away, a meeting was called among the colored people under the stereotype notice, business of importance. The betrayer was invited to attend. The people came at the appointed hour and organized the meeting by appointing a very religious old gentleman as president, who I believe made a prayer after which he addressed the meeting as follows. Friends, we've got him here, and I would recommend that you take the young man outside the door and just kill him. With this, a number of them bolted at him, but they were intercepted by some more timid of themselves, and the betrayer escaped their vengeance, and has not been seen in New Bedford since. I believe there have been no more such threats, and should there be hereafter, I doubt not that death would be the consequence. I found employment the third day after my arrival and stowing a sloop with a load of oil. It was new, dirty, and hard work for me, but I went at it with a glad heart and a willing hand. I was now my own master. It was a happy moment. The rapture of which can be understood only by those who have been slaves. It was the first work, the reward of which would be entirely my own. There was no Master Hugh standing ready that moment I earned my money to rob me of it. I worked that day with a pleasure I had never before experienced. I was at work for myself and my newly married wife. It was to me the starting of a new existence. When I got through with that job, I went in pursuit of a job of caulking. 
but such was the strength of prejudice against colored people among the white caulkers that they refused to work with me, and of course I could get no employment. Finding my trade of no immediate benefit, I threw off my caulking habiliments and prepared myself to do any kind of work I could get to do. Mr. Johnson kindly let me have his wood horse and saw, and I very soon found myself plenty of work. There was no work too hard, none too dirty. I was ready to saw wood, shovel coal, carry wood, sweep the chimney, or roll oil casts, all of which I did for nearly three years in New Bedford before I became known to the anti-slavery world. In about four months after I went to New Bedford, there came a young man to me and inquired if I did not wish to take the Liberator. I told him I did, but having just made my escape from slavery, I remarked that I was unable to pay for it then. I, however, finally became a subscriber to it. The paper came and I read it from week to week with such feelings as it would be quite idle for me to attempt to describe. The paper became my meat and drink. My soul was set on fire. Its sympathy for my brethren in bronze, its scathing denunciations of slaveholders, its faithful exposures of slavery, and its powerful attacks upon the upholders of the institution sent a thrill of joy through my soul, such as I had never felt before. I had not long been a reader of the Liberator before I got a pretty correct idea of the principles, measures, and spirit of the anti-slavery reform. I took right hold of the cause. I could do but little, but what I could, I did with a joyful heart, and never felt happier than when in an anti-slavery meeting. I seldom had much to say at the meetings, because what I wanted to say was said so much better by others. But while attending an anti-slavery convention at Nantucket on the 11th of August, 1841, I felt strongly moved to speak and was at the same time much encouraged to do so by Mr. William C. Coffin, a gentleman who had heard me speak in the colored people's meeting at New Bedford. It was a severe cross, and I took it up reluctantly. The truth was I felt myself a slave, and the idea of speaking to white people weighed on me down. I spoke but a few moments, when I felt a degree of freedom, and I said what I desired to say with considerable ease. From that time until now, I have been engaged in pleading the cause of my brethren. With what success and with what devotion, I leave those acquainted with my labors to decide.